I'm Shelley Quinn, and we welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. We are studying in the crucible with Christ, and today, Lesson 10 is meekness in the crucible. Let me introduce you to your 3ABN family who's joining me at the table today, Pastor John Lomacain. Yes, good to have you here, Shelley, and good to be here. I'm talking about interceding for grace. We'll find out how important grace is in our Christian walk. Amen. Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here with you, Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, Loving Those Who Hurt Us. Oh, wonderful. Mm. And Pastor John Denzi. It's a blessing to be here. I have Wednesdays, a closed mouth. <laughs> I oh. thought you were having a little accident there. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, Evangelist Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Our Rock and Refuge. Praise the Lord. Ryan, you want to have our opening prayer. Absolutely. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we need the Holy Spirit right now to lead and guide us in this study. Uh, we are so blessed and honored to be able to study, to be alive at this time, and to be yes. able to represent you and for all of us around the world uh, in sitting on this panel to be drawn together in a study of your word that's yes. going to uplift you, Lord. So take over this time. We give it to you. We ask you to lead and guide us and draw us to our uplifted Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Our memory text today is Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does this word meek mean? It means gentle, mild, and humble. Meekness accepts God's will and submits to God's will. Meekness prepares our hearts for sanctification. It fosters self-control. You know, Moses was a very strong leader, mm -hmm. was he not? But Numbers 12, 3 says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all who were on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Some uh, translations said he was very meek. You know, in Micah 6, 8, I love what Micah says. He says, You have shown us, O oh man, what is good, what does the Lord require of us, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Mm -hmm. When I think of meekness, you know who I think of? Jesus Christ, the man of all authority. Mm -hmm. He possessed all the authority of heaven. But in Matthew eleven twenty nine, he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, meek. I am lowly in heart. And if you do this, you're going to find rest in me. He gives us the perfect example of selfless humility mm -hmm. to preach the good tidings to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives. And he also consoled those who mourned. He gave them beauty instead of ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. Amen. So in Philippians 2, 5, 8, Paul says, hey, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself to become a man and to be obedient to the point of death. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is listed. And one of the fruit it's one fruit, but one portion of that fruit mm. is meekness. So we are to pursue gentleness is what the Bible tells us. In 1 Peter 3, 4, he says, A gentle and quiet spirit is acceptable to, in the sight of God. It's precious mm. in the sight of God. You know what? Our culture doesn't celebrate meekness, mm -mm. do we? Mm -mm. We, we, you know, we want to exalt ourselves. That's mm. the way that our culture is. But God said, if you exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Mm. And the day is coming when all of the kingdoms of the universe are going to be given to the saints. Now, meekness is defined in our quarterly as enduring injury with patience and without resentment. Mm. It says it's one of the most powerful characteristics of Jesus and his followers. So that gets us to Sunday's lesson. Mm. And I love this lesson. It is broken bread and 
poured out wine. Before we jump into the lesson, I just have to add this. When I'm thinking of broken bread and poured out wine, I think of the sacrificial ministry of Jesus. Mm. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25, Paul writes, the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread mm. and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he says, take, eat. This is my body, which is mm. broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took up the cup, the wine after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. So Christ was broken bread and poured out wine. That's but right. you know what? In Philippians 2, 7, Paul says, hey, I'm being offered as a drink offering. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the drink offering we find in Numbers 15, 3 through 4, it was poured on top of the animal sacrifices. And then as the flames were, were burning the sacrifice, the wine that was poured on top of the sacrifices vaporized into the air. And it was the only reason that Paul could be a drink offering is because he had drunk deeply of the living water of the Holy Spirit is what I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's the same spirit that's poured out on us. So our lesson brings out that Oswald Chambers says, in the process of being made broken bread and poured out wine, it means that you have to be the nourishment for others and for their souls until they learn to feed on God, mm. until they learn to draw on the life of the Lord Jesus directly. And Oswald Chambers says, we have to learn how to be broken bread and poured out wine. Where? On the line of intercession mm. more than on the line of personal contact. I find that very fascinating. He says, quit praying about yourself and spend your life for the sake of others mm. as the bond servant of Jesus. I always say intercessory ministry is the highest calling to ministry that there is. Mm. Why? It's the ministry of our risen and exalted Savior. He lives to intercede for us now. Now we have various examples in our lesson today of people who were broken bread and poured out wine. It mentions uh, Moses who endured waves of gossip and criticism as he led the people to the promised land. It mentions Joseph who was betrayed and imprisoned mm. as he was before he was brought to a position of service in Egypt. And I love what our writer, Anthony mm. Gavin says. He says that God permitted these situations so that these people's lives could become theaters of grace. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Amen. Theaters of grace and care, not only for themselves, but for others. But the crucible that was endured by Ezekiel is one of our primary points in today's lesson. And here's what happened. God tells Ezekiel his wife is going to die. Now, Ezekiel, Ezekiel was madly in love with his mm. wife. She was the desire of his eyes. She was precious in his sight. It says she was his pride, his delight. But God tells him, she's going to die and you can't mourn. Mm -hmm. Don't you mourn. Can you imagine mm -mm. Mm -hmm. losing Angie? And God said, no tears, mm -hmm. no mourning. But God did this because he's going to use Ezekiel as a sign. Mm. And Ezekiel submits to God's will. Wow. But this was a symbol symbolic act. It was a heartbreaking sign mm. to show all of the exiles that they could not mourn publicly over the destruction of Jerusalem for which their sins were responsible. Mm. Wow. Mm. In other words, the national sorrow would eclipse personal sorrow. Mm. Think about that. Oh. National sorrow should eclipse personal sorrow. So Ezekiel, when he was in Babylon, he remained silent for two years mm. until his prophecies of the destruction 
of Judah and Jerusalem came true and the captives arrived. Our lesson says Ezekiel 24, 24. God says, Ezekiel will be assigned to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. Mm. So Ezekiel in meekness accepted God's commandment. And through his example, the children of Israel were going to be convicted of the truth of who God was, the sovereign Lord. And they then would see this truth as they ex experienced the fulfillment of the prophecy that Ezekiel's life was symbolizing. So here's the point of the lesson. Sometimes things happen to us and the way we react, suffering has a relationship with meekness. If we learn to be meek before the Lord, to be gentle, mm. we can be a sign to other people. Mm, it's, it's like when we learn to accept, meekness can be a strength, mm. not a weakness, because God will use us to minister to others. You know, it's easy to feel hurt or to feel angry in certain situations. But meekness is the God-given ability of, it's the part of the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit, to endure suffering with patience mm -hmm. and without resentment. So let me read something to you from The Desire of Ages, page 301. Ellen White writes, the difficulties we have to encounter may be very much lessened by that meekness which hides itself in Christ. If we possess the humility of our master, we shall rise above the slights, the rebuffs, the annoyances to which we are exposed, and they will cease to cast a gloom over the spirit. The highest evidence of nobility in a Christian is self-control. He who will endure abuse or cruelty fails to, maintain, fails to maintain a calm and trustful spirit, robs God of his right to reveal in him his own perfection of character. Lowliness of heart is a strength that gives victory mm -hmm. to right. the followers of Christ. That's right. It is the token of their connection with the courts above. Amen. That's Desire of Ages, page 301. Meekness in the crucible. Amen. Thank you, thank Amen. you, Shelley. Mm -hmm. Wow, each of these lessons are gonna build on the other one, and mine is about grace, interceding for grace. Let's go right to Exodus 32. We're gonna go all the way down to verses 14, but we're gonna break them up into two categories. One is the sin of Israel. The second is the interposition and intercession of Moses and how God's grace was poured through his life at a moment when the people were deserving of something other than grace. Mm. Exodus 32, verse 1 to 10. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Just like today, mm. men, women, and girls wear earrings. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with the engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Hmm, today. Wow. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down for your people have, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Notice God's disassociation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do that today. When they're misbehaving, go get your son. Right. <laughs> when they're doing well, <laughs> look at my son. Right. 
God, God set point. the pattern. The people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, verse 9, and the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now Moses is into position and intercession. Mm. Notice what he asks for in verse 11 to 14. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And here is the response of God. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. So often we don't understand the beauty of our intercession in behalf of those that cannot do better or are choosing not to do better. Mm. I look at my sister, for example, so many times throughout the years of left the church at 16, she's now 66, 50 years, and she's been in so many situations, even as an EMT at Ground Zero on September 11th, back in 2001, and, and she made the decision, I believe God touched her heart to make the decision to go to work four hours later. Had she gone four hours earlier, she would have died with her compatriots mm. when the building came down. Mm. And all through our lives, every day I pray for my sister, for God to sustain her. She lost so many friends in the post 9-11 incident that died of all the diseases, kidney failure, cancer from all the harmful toxins that were there. And she was there nine months mm. at ground zero and lost the use of her kidneys, but she's still doing well today. Got a new kidney that's been lasting for a long time. And I'm still praying that God will bring her in. And I believe that if we decide to intercede in behalf of those who are, who are not yet where God wants them to be, we'll appreciate something that's called not grow in, not grow because of grace, but grow in grace. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at this in mm -hmm. 2 Peter 3 verse 17. Grow in grace is a very powerful thing. And I'm just going to simply read verses 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the errors of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now notice something, grow in grace. The illustration I could use is a plant doesn't grow into the pot to become a plant. It grows in the pot because it is a plant. A fish doesn't swim into the sea to become a fish. It swims in the sea because it is a fish. We don't grow into God's grace. We grow in God's grace because that's the only place that a Christian can allow human frailty to still reveal the glory of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need the grace of God. When we get to heaven, we're not going to get to heaven because of 28 fundamentals. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to heaven because of God's grace. Amen. You know, the Bible talks about the 12 gates mm -hmm. to the New Jerusalem. And one writer suggests that we go through the gate that best describes what we overcame. But I, I believe that every, gate is, going to, every gate is going to be a gate of grace. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Titus 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, so everyone that will be saved, everyone that will not be saved will recognize that God has not withheld his grace from anyone. Mm -hmm. But those who receive the grace of God and grow in it, here's what we have the obligation to do. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. How can we do that? John 1 verse 14 because Jesus is the one referred to as full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. So when Christ is abiding in us, all that we need is revealed in and through his life. Let me also go further down in the interest of sharing with you what I believe I can cover at this particular time. We have to also remember that when people are in difficulty, there's a grace that God is requiring of us to extend to those who are not yet where they ought to be. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, 
Here is the prerequisite. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Mm. And Paul told Timothy, his protege, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 and 26, why do we need grace? Because there are times when, I'll be honest with you, I think my good friend, a pastor, I won't mention, I won't mention his name, but a pastor once said, very well-known pastor, he says, why don't God allow us to slap some people sometimes? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, very, very familiar uh, pastor, I won't mention his name, uh, but um, sometimes we feel that we want to just kind of grab somebody and shake them up. <laughs> but listen what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 and 26, to 26. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So yes, we need the grace of God because there are times when our humanity tries to overwhelm the fact that we are partakers of a divine nature and we want to appeal to our humanity rather than to the divinity that Christ has so freely offered to us. That's why this quotation is significant before I pass it back to Shelley. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 113, paragraph 1. And this has helped me through the years. Since 1995, when God revealed this to me, this has given me the, this has given me the, uh, the blueprint of how to be in times of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says, life is disciplinary. While in the world, the Christian will meet with adverse influences. Mm. There will be provocations to test the temper. And it is by meeting these in a right spirit that the Christian graces are developed. Mm. If injuries and insults are meekly borne, if insulting words are responded to by gentle answers and oppressive acts by kindness, this is evidence that the spirit of Christ dwells in the heart, that sap from the living vine is flowing to the branches. Mm. So it's not what happens to us, and I've said this before, but God has given me this, and I, I'm becoming repetitious here because it's not what happens to us, but it's what happens in us mm -hmm. that determines whether or not we are evidenced to be connected to Christ or connected to the enemy and displaying human flesh mm -hmm. rather than God's abundant grace. Amen. Why is it important for us to display God's abundant grace? Matthew 5 and verse 9. I believe this is the cadence for all Christians. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Only as we display God's abundant grace can we display the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. And grace is most needed when it's least deserved. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Now, as we continue, we're going to invite Pastor James Rafferty to do Tuesday's lesson. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, Loving Those Who Hurt Us. It's based in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. And the author calls us to read these verses. So we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. It's basically uh, a summary of a sermon that Jesus is sharing with a group of people on the Mount of Beatitudes. And as he summarizes his thoughts here, beginning with verse 43, he literally shocks the people that are listening to him. Now, mm. these people are religious people. A lot of them are Jews. Some of them are Pharisees. And he has taken them to a whole new level, a whole new standard of belief in Christianity and in what it means to be a believer in God. And he summarizes here in these verses, beginning in verse 43, you have heard that it's been said, this is something is used all through the sermon, thou shalt love thine enemies and, or love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, but 
I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Stop right there. Now this is shocking to those who are listening. They're, they're overwhelmed, as we are today probably, overwhelmed with this idea. Yes. But then he adds something, kind of like, you know, the cherry on the top, something that is even, goes even further to astound them, if you will. He says, not only that you may be the, father, uh, the children of your Father which is in heaven, but he says, for he, for he makes his reign, his son, excuse me, makes his son to, to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, it's one thing for God to be calling the people there to this standard that is maybe higher than them, but then for Jesus to add to that, that God actually has that standard before you do. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is the basis of our Christian experience. God is calling us not to do something that he doesn't already do. God is calling us to step into the reality of who he is. That's right. God is calling us to step into his very own experience. He's sending sun, he's sending rain on the just, on the unjust, on the good, and on the evil. You don't see this phenomena, unless, of course, you're right at the point where the rain is no longer falling. Sometimes I've been driving down the road and we're in a rainstorm and all of a sudden we, we get to a certain point on the road and there's no more rain. Hmm. But most of the time when it's raining, it's raining on the houses of the Christians and it's also raining on the houses of those who aren't Christians. Right. You know, mm -hmm. when you see the sun shining, it's shining on all the houses that are Christians and it's also shining on the houses that aren't Christians. This is God's, what we call, grace, unmerited favor to the whole world. And Jesus is bringing this up in the context of this new sermon, if you will, this cutting edge sermon to the people there on the Mount of Beatitudes. He goes on here and he says, uh, verse, where do we leave off? Verse You're probably 46. 46. 46 right. Yep. For if you love them which love you, hmm. what reward have ye? For do not even publicans the same? And publicans would be tax collectors, IRS, right? Government workers, whatever you want to apply them to in, in our day. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even publicans so. And here it comes. Here's the conclusion. Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, how many times have we taken that last verse completely out of context? Mm. And we've applied that to everything and anything but what Christ was applying it to. In fact, we've applied it to the very things that he was rebuking here. We've applied it to a lower standard. We've applied it to our outward appearance and the things that we eat and the things that we believe and, you know, the fundamentals. We're not applying it to relationships that mm. have gone awry, relationships right. that are difficult for us to navigate, relationships with people who spitefully use us and mm -hmm. persecute us, relationships with people who are difficult, if we find difficulty navigating. And that's what Jesus is doing here because he's taking us right to the very crux of the issue. And the crux of the issue is you can look good, but you are not good. And you need a heart transformation. And God is going to allow us to come in contact with situations and difficulties in the guise of people, just like with Job and his friends, that bring out the need that we have, which mm -hmm. is a heart transformation. That's right. don't, don't be upset. Don't even question whether or not you are a believer or a Christian or, or a follower of God because these things come out. But praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that they come out because God is seeking to get you to turn to Him yes. and a revelation of who He is that can bring you to that higher plane, that higher standard. Uh, you know, the words of that hymn, um, I'm, look, I'm walking on the onward way, new heights mm -hmm. I'm gaining on. every day. I'm pressing on the onward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. God is bringing us to new heights every day. And He doesn't bring it to us all at once, you know, because it would overwhelm us. It would overwhelm mm. us. So next week and then the next month and the next year and then you know I've been at this for 38 years now plus and all of a sudden I'm starting to see things that I never saw before when I was a single guy man I had I was just on the straight and narrow I had all my ducks in a row I had every T crossed and every I dotted and and then I got married and it had nothing to do with my wife I started seeing things in myself that I hadn't noticed before, right? You notice things about yourself when you're around other people. Right. Uh, and then we got some pets and then we got kids. In <laughs> other words, right, God is showing us more and more of ourselves 
Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And when things offend, when things are coming in and rubbing us, it's, it's a call for us to come into that peace, that grace that God has for us. And so God is, is revealing this to the people through Christ. They're, they, you can just imagine what they're thinking, probably the same thing we're thinking, but even more so because they hate the Romans. Man, they, just, they just hate the Romans. And God's saying, hey, I love the Romans. You know, yes. I, I send rain, I send shun, sunshine on the Romans. I love the Romans. In fact, God loves all people. You know, the Bible says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, world that He gave His only begotten Son. And that's, a, that's an unconditional gift that God has given to us. Now, why did He give us that unconditional gift? So that whosoever will would believe, right? God loves us unconditionally in order for us to be saved. He knows that the power of salvation comes through a manifestation of this unconditional love. That's why we're told in John chapter 1, verse 9, that Jesus Christ is the light that lights all those who come into the world, right? Every single person is lighted by Jesus Christ. We're told in Acts chapter 17, Paul is hanging out there on Athens, on Mars Hill in, in Athens and he says, you know, to the unknown God, in Him you live and move and have your being. That's right. All people have life and breath in all things through Jesus Christ. And then we're told in um, Romans chapter 10 and of course Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, but Romans chapter, chapter 10, uh, no, not Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 14, God has given a measure of faith to all people, mm, that's right? right. That's He's right. the author of our faith. Right. So God gives us His love, He gives us His life, He gives us light, He gives us faith. Uh, Titus 2 verse 11, mm -hmm. the grace of God has appeared unto all. That's God right. gives, He's bathed us with this atmosphere of grace. The sun and the rain remind us of the atmosphere of grace in which we are bathed. God draws all people. Jesus says uh, in John chapter 12, 32, I, if I be lifted up on the cross of Calvary, will draw all, mm -hmm. not just the Christians, not just the believers, not just those who have potential. I'm going to draw everyone to me. I'm even going to draw the fallen angels to me. I'm going to draw, not that they can be saved, I'm going to draw them because they're going to see something that this universe needs to see and that is, right. is my unconditional love for the world, my self-sacrificing, mm. other-centered love for the world and it's going to answer the great controversy. And that's what we're told in Revelation chapter 12. I always go back to Revelation, you know that. Revelation yeah, chapter right. 12, the prince of this world is cast out. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 12. Now has come salvation and strength, we're told mm -hmm. in Revelation chapter 12. He died for all Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 tells us he mediates for all, right Shelley? Jesus Christ is the mediator for all men. He is the, the savior of all men. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10, he's the mediator of all men. He gives love to all men. He gives light to all men. He gives faith to all men. He gives grace to all men. And so Jesus Christ has come to reveal the Father. This is what the Father is like. This is what the Father looks like. If you've mm -hmm. seen me, you've seen the Father. And of course, these words are going to come out of His mouth. What else would come out of His mouth? Be ye therefore perfect, mm -hmm. as your Father in heaven is perfect. But in Luke, we have a little bit different ending to the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter right. 6 and verse 36 gives a little bit of a different slant to the Sermon on the Mount. And I really think that perhaps because of our misunderstanding of the word perfect, that perhaps Luke gives us a better ending that helps us to understand what Jesus is really talking about. He goes through all of the same points and he ends in Luke 6, 36 and he says, be therefore merciful, merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Mm -hmm. In other words, perfection is being merciful. Mercy mm -hmm. and perfection right. are one and the same thing. And of course, mercy implies the imperfection of the object upon which it is bestowed. Mm. Oh, Unfallen angels don't need mercy, but human beings need mercy. And God that's is saying, right. listen, I have poured out upon you every good thing. I have, I have saturated you with my grace. Now, what I want you to do to those Romans, what I want you to do to those Republicans and those Democrats, what I want you to do to those people that you have such a hard time with is I want you to be merciful as your Father in heaven has been merciful to you. Amen. 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 Praise amen. the Lord. What a blessing so far we have. Uh, received and I hope you have been blessed so far. We are now in Wednesday's portion of the lesson. My name is John Dinsey and the lesson is entitled, creative title, A Closed Mouth. Now, why is it given this title? It is because of sometimes we have to endure things as Christians and keep our mouths shut. Mm. So the most powerful example, the lesson says, of meekness in the crucible come from Jesus. When He said to come and learn 
of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Matthew 11, 29. Now, this is interesting because Jesus, uh, when you consider him, he is worthy of all praise. The very presence of Jesus commands respect and they want to bow before him. But he says, come and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. What an example we have in Jesus. He says in the lesson, he meant it in ways we probably can't imagine. I also want to read this from the lesson. It says, it is terrible to watch someone else treat another unjustly. Mm. And it is extremely painful when we are at the receiving end of such treatment. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is because it says here, we normally have a strong sense of justice. When injustice occurs, our instincts are to put things right while carrying out that what we believe to be a righteous and just anger. I remember when I was, uh, I think it was a second grade, something happened by we were, where we were sitting. I was in a public school and uh, the, the guy sitting across from me, he made a mess and everybody was giggling about it in that area. And the teacher said, what's going on back there? And the teacher walked over to where we were and he asked, who made this mess? Mm. And uh, he looked at both of us, because uh, apparently he thought one of us did it. And the guy next to me, he says, I swear by the Virgin Mary, it wasn't me. <laughs> and so the teacher automatically, come here. I was in trouble. I didn't swear by the Virgin Mary, so he thought I must be guilty. So he made an example of me and put me in front of the class. And he says, for anybody else that makes a mess like this, this is what's going to happen to you. And I was there sad, upset. And I was like, why in the world? Did that make him automatically innocent? Mm. He was the guilty one, mm. but he used, I swear by the Virgin Mary, and he got away with it. Mm. And so sometimes we suffer unjustly. Mm. I didn't like being uh, up there in the front, being an mm. example to the whole class uh, of, yo, he's guilty, he's the one that did this mess. And so we suffer and sometimes we have to understand the best witness that can be is for us to be silent. I'm going to read this also from the lesson. It is not easy to live like this. Mm. It is perhaps impossible unless we embrace one critical truth that in all unjust situations, we must believe that our Father in heaven is in control and that he will act on our behalf when it is according to his will. That's right. In the lesson we are called to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, I'm going to back up a little bit to give a background. So I'm going to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Notice, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here, that's right, for us here, in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ Amen. as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Mm -hmm. This is who we have been redeemed by, by Jesus Christ as a lamb without uh, spot or without blemish. So now we go into 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Notice he's making a special focus on servants because they are in a situation that could be out of their control. Mm -hmm. It says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. What? Paul, don't you understand how hard I have it is this guy? This is horrible. He's harsh. They're harsh on me. But he says to be submissive. Mm. Why? Continuing, uh, continuing on, uh, he says, For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. This is commendable. Mm. This is worthy of honor. God is honoring us with the privilege of uh, demonstrating before people the character of God. Why? Because it is a witness to people, reminding us that in uh, Matthew chapter 5, it says, let your light so shine before men mm -hmm. that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
There is a similar passage in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 through 24. Notice what it says here. Bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. So we, have, we should do it with sincerity of heart. For this, we have to be surrendered to the Lord. Mm. It's not putting out an act, oh, I have to do this because I have to do this. No, it, with sincerity of heart, allowing the Lord to work through you. And notice what it says in verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, mm. knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Mm. So in the situations that we are, whatever our situation is, whether it is at home, school or work, and we have to deal with harsh people, mm. we should serve doing it heartily as serving the Lord and not men. So moving on to verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. This may be a message to them to help them make a decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting in the book, The Great Controversy, there is a quote here that is very, very powerful. I want you to consider it. It says, the gospel continued to sp spread. I'm reading from Great Controversy, page uh, 41. Uh, the gospel continued to spread and the number of the adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible, even to the eagles of Rome, said a Christian, expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging uh, forward the persecu persecution. You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent. Nor, do, nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Mm. This was quoted also in Tertullian, Tertullian Apology, uh, paragraph 50. So here we have an example. Even they, in those times, the way Christians suffered was a message to others and hearts were touched and lives were converted. Mm. Recently, a few months ago, I read in a magazine, I think it was the ASI magazine, a story, a modern story. Mm. It's a real story of a place in a Muslim country and this Muslim man, his story was being told, his picture was there and his face was darkened so you do not see who he is. He used to be part of a gang. And as a Muslim, his job was to find Christians, beat them and torture them and if necessary, kill them. And he said, I was so impressed by the way these Christians suffered that I said, there's something about what they believe in. There's something about this Jesus they believe in. So he decided to look into it. And the story was telling his testimony mm. that because of the way these Christians suffered, mm. he was led to follow Jesus. Wow. And he was converted, a powerful, powerful testimony. Mm. And so uh, I encourage you, mm. if you are in a situation and if you are called to suffer for Christ, and if it's uh, your part to be quiet, be quiet. Let that be, uh, sometimes silence is eloquence, I've heard, and this is a time when silence can be eloquence in favor of the gospel. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, mm. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Christ suffered, and he was beaten and uh, abused, tortured, and he suffered quietly. Mm. He suffered and that was a testimony that we should imitate. Uh, verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Mm. And so we have here that Christ has left us an example to follow. And if need be, if the Lord wants us to speak, he will give us the words to speak, but they will be spoken in love and demonstration of the Spirit of Christ. Amen. Mm. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I'm Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled Our Rock and Refuge. And man, this, this lesson, whoo, this lesson really spoke to me. Mm. And I know that much of what we're going to study in this lesson 
many of you can understand it. You can relate to it. And I know many of us here on this panel. Um, I try to avoid just reading big sections of the lesson because I know you at home are going to do that and around the world at, at your churches. But uh, sometimes it's worded just so well, you just got to read it. And I love the intro to this lesson because it really sets us up for the content that we're going to be covering. And so it brings out, it says, so often the most proud people, the most arrogant and pushy are those who suffer from low self-esteem. Mm. Their arrogance and pride and total lack of meekness or humility exist as a cover, perhaps even unconsciously, for something lacking inside. Mm -hmm. What they need is something we all need, a sense of security, mm -hmm. of worthiness, of acceptance, especially in times of distress and suffering. Mm -hmm. We can find that only through the Lord, in short, it says, uh, we, it says we can only find that through the Lord. And then it says, in short, meekness and humility, far from being attributes of weakness, are often the most powerful manifestation of a soul firmly grounded on the rock. Mm. That one right there is a, is a little bit of a, a conviction to myself because the Lord is, we're all growing, right? Mm. And uh, that's the one thing I, I kind of have been open about my lack of patience and sometimes meekness. The Lord is, is, is working on me. So pray for me, brothers and sisters. But I love that last line there that uh, in short, meekness and humility, far from being attributes of weakness, are often the most powerful manifestation of a soul firmly grounded on the rock. And then it brings us to Psalm chapter 61, verses 1 through 8. So we're going to go there, Psalm 61, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And the lesson, it basically brings out and says, what can we learn from this great passage? And, oh man, as I was reading it, it's just powerful. I've read it many times, but, you know, the fact that it's brought within the context of this lesson, you know, Christ or God, our refuge and, and uh, our rock, our rock and refuge, uh, it's a powerful message. So Psalm 61, we're going to start with verse 1 and read through verse 8. It says, truly my soul silently awaits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah, it says, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. What reference was that again? Psalm 61 verses 1 62. through 8. 62. Psalm 62. Oh, is it, is it Psalm 62? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for that correction. Yes. So let's just Lord. correct that. Psalm 62 verses 1 through 8 is what I was just reading, just for those who may want to go back and read that again. Uh, but this is a powerful passage mm. uh, that it, it's just highlighting the humility of, of the writer here who's pouring out his heart and saying, you know what? God is my refuge. God is my strength. I don't, go, I don't have to go out and, and open myself up and exhaust myself and my energies to fight my my battles or to come against my enemies. God is the one who does that for me. Amen. And, you know, there's an Ellen White quote here in the Upward Look, page 177, that, man, when I read this thing, it was just like, I, I have been here. I, I understand this this part here because I think all of us many at times at times in our life we experience aspects in our relationship with God in our walk with God where the enemy will try to use others in within the ministry context I'll just say sometimes the devil will use others in ministry or within your uh, ministry uh, sphere of influence to sometimes bring you down or to try to discourage you or to try to attack you in a way that will cause contentions mm -hmm. and it's interesting because in this quote here this is the Upward Look, page 177. Listen to this, powerful words. It says, without cause, men will become our enemies. Mm. The motives of the people of God will be misinterpreted, not only by the world, but by their own brethren. Mm. Yeah. The Lord's servants will be put in hard places 
a mountain will be made of a molehill to justify men in pursuing a selfish, unrighteous course. By misrepresentation, these men will be clothed in the dark vestments of dishonesty because circumstances beyond their control made their work perplexing. Hmm. They, will be, uh, they will be pointed to as men that cannot be trusted. And this will be done by the members of the church. Hmm. God's servants must arm themselves with the mind of Christ. They must expect to escape insult and misjudgment. Excuse me, let me read that again. They must not, let me clarify, they must not expect to escape insult and misjudgment. They will be called enthusiasts and fanatics, mm. but let them not become discouraged. God's hands are on the wheel of his providence, mm. guiding his work to the glory of his name. Amen. Wow. Amen. Wow, that is so true. And as I was reading through that, also taking in consideration what we read in Psalm 62 which just a moment ago and the beginning portion of this lesson, as I was going through this lesson, I thought of Daniel. Mm. Daniel was a righteous man. Mm. In fact, uh, he was, you know, while we know that he was a sinner because the Bible says that all have sinned, there's nothing negative recorded about Daniel the prophet uh, as there are other major Bible characters. But it's interesting that uh, if you read Daniel chapter 6 verses 1 through 5, it gives us a glimpse of just what we just read, that in times where the enemy has a plan to even possibly use members of our church, brethren within our influence or within our sphere or close by us, sometimes uh, we have to just... As, as we just learned, close our mouth and recognize that the Lord is leading us, that the Lord is guiding in the situation, that He will take over and He will bring us out of this dark situation that we may be in. Uh, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Uh, it's quite interesting. I love this story because it says, It pleased Darius or Darius to set up the kingdom 120 satraps, and being over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, and the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to settling him over the whole realm or setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Notice where they're going. You know what? We're not going to find any fault in this brother. Well, you know what? We can find some type of fault in the law of his God. And you know the rest of the story. They go on to conspire against Daniel and to basically deceive the king in passing this law of the Medes and the Persians that says Daniel can't pray or anyone in the kingdom can't pray to anyone or praise anyone other than the king of the Medes and the the Persians. And it's quite interesting because Daniel chapter six, verse 10, it says now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. And as it was his custom since early days, this brother went to that window. He opened one. He opened the second one. He kneeled down right there so the world could see him. And he was praising God and he was praying to his God because there was no one or anything that was going to keep him from being the righteous man that he was. And, and so in this case, my friends, I just have to ask the question, can you be bold for God? Can we be bold for God? Can you and us, can all of us be radical for God among a culture, among a people, among a society that scoffs at the thought of true, genuine Christianity? We have to come to a point where we allow God to be our refuge, that we stake our faith in him and know that he will fight our battles. I think of Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, and dust them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But in contrast, Jesus says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. My friends, get out of the sand. Leave that sand alone. <laughs> put, your, put your life, stake your faith and, and ground yourself on the rock of Jesus Christ today. 
Amen. Amen. Glory Amen. to God. What a wonderful lesson. We're really enjoying this quarterly, and I know you are as well. We have just a couple of moments for some closing comments. Pastor John? Yes, Romans 3, verse 23 and 24. You know, I love the fact that there's only one thing higher than God's law. It is His grace. It's His mercy. The mercy Amen. seat is above Amen. the law of God. That's good. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's grace. Amen. 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 First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says, love hopes all things, bears all things, and endures all things. God isn't necessarily calling us to like other people or like what other people do, but He's calling us to love them. That is to hope the best for them, to bear with them, to pray for them, to intercede for them. That is the principle of love. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we have to suffer for things that we have not done. In other words, suffer wrongfully. But by the grace of the Lord, we can suffer wrong uh, for things we have not done with grace and dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. I love what Jesus says to the Pharisees in Matthew 21, verses 42 and 44. He says, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, that this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes? And then verse 44, He says, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And I can't help but every time I read that text, to fall on this stone, whoever falls on this stone will be broken. I think of that song, lean on me. Amen. When you're not strong, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. Lean on me. Amen. Lean on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Make him your rock and refuge mm -hmm. today. Amen. Oh, thank you so much, Amen. Ryan, Johnny, James, and John. And we just have to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek, for they mm -hmm. shall inherit the earth. Meekness is to be mild, to be gentle, to be humble, like our Savior, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, who said, I am meek and lowly in heart. In His ministry of self-sacrificing love made Him broken bread mm -hmm. and poured out wine mm -hmm. for all. And what you can do to do that is start interceding. Be like Jesus. Hebrews 7.25 says He's able to save to the uttermost who come to God through Him because He always lives to make intercession for them. Join us next week and we will be talking about waiting in the crucible.